So people are asking me if this is, uh, if this is our, our kind of first meetup post-pandemic. And I would say this is our first meetup, as we said, I think ever, our first in-person meetup. I'm pretty sure we did some classes before. Um, but yeah, this, this feels super fun. Um, and I wanted to talk about um, large models because I feel like that's such an like, exciting um, thing. I was talking with a bunch of you about you know, people are coming from really different levels of experience. But I think it's really interesting, all this stuff going on in the space. I, I gave this talk um, a few months ago, and then I had to like, really change so much of this you know, just to make it up to date for, for tonight, which is a really cool um, sign. Um, you know, as Alexi said, uh, I, I used to run a company called, called Figure 8 that collected training data for machine learning. Maybe some of you remember it um, before that was called Crowdflower. And now I, I run a company called um, Weights and Biases. And um, you know, I think many of you that came use Weights and Biases. We started off as um, experiment tracking, and then we've expanded into a whole bunch of um, stuff to handle the, the MLOps um, workflow. This is not about weights and biases, but if you do want a demo of weights and biases or a t-shirt, send me an email. I'd be happy to, to give you either at any time. Um, I think it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at um, how we kind of got to this place where we are with, um, with large models. I mean, it's a funny um, adjustment for me, right? Because I was running a company that did um, data collection. And so, you know, I'd always talk about this like unreasonableness, effectiveness of data. Do you guys, anybody remember that? Like Peter Norvig, you know, maybe like 20 years ago now, talking about how like data is really the thing that makes ML work and the applications where it works is where there's lots of data. And then Google in 2017, they published this um, blog post where they talked about, you know, even at like bigger scales, really it's the data um, that, that makes machine learning work. But it's kind of an interesting moment that they did this because it was like just on the eve of, you know, coming up with transformers and, and maybe this sort of getting a little bit more complicated. Right, and so then you know you have like attention mechanisms, um, which which came along I think originally to help with um, uh, LSTMs, right? Because LSTMs had such a hard time like looking far back in time, and it's so clear with translation that you know you don't want to look at kind of every single word to know how to translate a particular um, word, and so yeah, I mean so so attention mechanisms. Remember that it was like so it was like exciting and you get these cool pictures where you know it'd be like you know what what um, words align with what for like a translation or you know kind of an image you know what parts of the image it's looking at such a kind of evocative uh, method right and then um, you know you, that famous attention all, is all you need paper um, came out that showed that you don't necessarily even need you know like GRUs or LSTMs you could just kind of do it with um, attention mechanisms um, and um, and then transformers came along right and so um, you know, basically using this transform mechanism pros in that paper, um, you see that at more and more and more parameters, there's this um, kind of consistent logarithmic improvement in the, the performance of the models. And this kind of, you know, extends out as far as people have tried at this point, right? I think there's a debate right now, you know, how far this really goes, but it does seem like transformers at, you know, massive scales work, um, you know, work, work super, super well. Um, oh, thanks. Thank you. Whoa. Um, and so, you know, data sizes, um, you know, continue to grow and the bigger models kind of continue to take advantage of the larger and larger um, data sizes. You saw, you know, Chinchilla came out, um, you know, this year um, training on like even kind of more data. You know, I think there, you know, folks say there's like a, maybe another magnitude or maybe another two magnitudes of, um, you know, like language left <laughs> to, to consume, right? But it's, you know, it's kind of remarkable how like, you know, they have like all of Wikipedia and that's like a tiny fraction of the data that, um, you know, they trained on. Um, and then, um, I don't know if you saw Andre Karpati's mini GPT, but I'll just say, like, if you kind of want to get your hands on, a lot of this is, like, about how you could get your hands dirty with this. I thought this was such a cool project um, that came out where he tries to um, distill Transformers um, and, you know, GPT, which was the, the open AI project, down into, like, its essence. Um, and so you can actually use this project to sort of see how few lines of code you really need to make a... Um, transformer. So I love to learn by doing. And if you want to build a transformer yourself, it's funny. I was like doing it, and then I like saw this project, and I was like, oh, actually, Andre, of course, um, you know, made a, you know, made a far better version of what I was trying to make, as usual. Um, so then uh, GPT three, um, you know, you probably notice, uh, you know, it's kind of the, I think like. Maybe, I don't know if you guys feel this way, I feel like it's kind of the most sort of like impressive, maybe like biggest train model that you can actually like access, um, you know, right now. Um, and, 
you know, GPT came out back in, in 2018. Um, it was kind of like this, this um, breakthrough and actually like, you know, kind of worked well across tons of um, natural language tasks, which was really interesting, right? Like I think like, you know, not that long ago, like when I was in grad school, you felt like, you know, kind of each task required its own model and its like own techniques. It's sort of been interesting to watch how these models now like run across like so many different, you know, NLP tasks um, at, at once. Um, and, and again, the, you know, the number of parameters really matter. And then I think like GPT-3, if you haven't used it, I'm surprised how many of my friends in machine learning haven't actually kind of like played um, with these models, but um, it really is actually like an incredible thing that basically just is a text, it's a, it's a large language model, so it generates text. But you know, what you can do with it is lots of stuff. So we've had, you know, at Weights and Vices, we've had tons and tons of people um, play with it and write reports. So if you go to, I guess, if you go to wb.me slash gpt3 dash, Doctor Who, you can see, you know, kind of generating Doctor Who things, which is kind of like a fun um, example. But then you can take these same techniques and solve all these classical problems, right? So, you know, for example, you can do sentiment analysis just through text generation, right? Where you're like showing a tweet, and then you say like sentiment colon, um, you know, positive or sentiment colon negative, um, and um, and then you can actually do translation just by setting this up. I'm amazed how many people actually don't know this. This translation system is like pretty world class, you know, like you literally just like, here's some text in English, and you're just like putting this into the GPT-3 um, interface. And, um, you know, I don't know if you guys, anybody see this reasoning thing? I thought this was super cool, um, where, you know, and this is sort of like the prompt engineering that's actually getting like really important to make these things work, um, that we see more and more of our, our customers doing, right, where you're basically, you know, you have this like zero shot learning case. Actually amazing this works at all, right? So you're just like feeding in kind of like a simple logic puzzle or a simple like kind of math puzzle. And then you're typing in A, the answer you know, is, and then it like auto-completes off into the right answer, right? And this is like incredibly hard task, right? It's amazing that this model can kind of do it sometimes. And then I guess um, some researchers found that if you ask, if you add, here's the answer, and then you say, let's think step by step, it actually does much better, um, which is such an evocative um, you know, result. And I think caused people to, to, to try a lot more um, you know, stuff here. And if you talk to the GPT-3 folks, um, they spend a lot of time with their um, uh, they spend a lot of time with their customers, kind of helping them write this. Actually, you know, a good friend of mine, um, Anthony, is a you know, CEO of Kaggle for a long time, and I showed him a couple days ago how you could do this, and then he he was like really surprised that it, it works so well. And then it was funny; his wife's actually a lawyer, and his wife was a much better prompt engineer because it was like <laughs> she was like really writing like specifically what the model should do, and he got his accuracy from like already better than his like classical machine learning techniques that he was using to, so it was better, but then it got like even better when his, his wife stepped in and did more like lawyer style um, prompt engineering, which I thought was really interesting. And this is for um, named entity extraction, which isn't like an obvious, isn't super obvious that that would, that would work. Um, and then um, I just want to brag, you know, we have a, an integration with, um, with OpenAI that we would love for you to use. If you just call OpenAI, you know, WandaDB Sync, then you can actually send your results um, to weights and biases. And we, we'd love if you use it. I think like, I've always been a huge fan of um, fine tuning, and I think it's really cool to support cases where you know you're starting with this giant model that was trained on you know hundreds of millions of dollars of compute. You can actually like get that, tweak it for your task, and then um, use it for kind of any problem or, or domain. Um, and um, and yeah, and you can use you know our tables to visualize the results and and um, you know lineage tracking. I think it's just like this graph is like so evocative to me, right? Where like you sort of see this like trend. Um, of um, you know the, the training compute and publication date, and you sort of see this like inflection point. Um, and I think this doesn't even include, and, and this is because our, so I want to say this is because the model size like really um, matters. Um, let's see, um, and you know you can see this like you know in the numbers you can see it in the the way the results look. Um, but it's just I think like like I guess I would say for those of you who have been like watching the space recently. You know what's about to happen, right? Is this this curve is about to inflect a little bit more, right? Because it's just like so super clear these transformers work at these large scales. People are finally like making enough um, compute to be available. So like I think right now like many companies are trying now to to train these models at like another order of magnitude um, of size. So like the real winner is probably chip companies. Um, there's also I don't know if you guys have seen this. So Jasper AI is like one of the fastest growing startups of all time that basically has just taken um, GPT-3 and, and use it to kind of create marketing content, right? Which is a little bit of like a sad 
use case maybe, sorry, just. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, I don't know, like I think if I was like, you know, an entrepreneur kind of interested in this, it's like, this is, this, they went from $1 million in revenue to $70 million in revenue like in a year. And so they, this is like really like working on top of, um, uh, just on top of GPT-3. You know, they, they just kind of like got it to, to work well. Um, and you know, there's like a whole bunch of um, these big models that have been made, released in different ways, right? So, um, you know, Chinchilla, I think, uh, I think Meta recently said that they were gonna actually open up their, their model that they, that they came out. So maybe there'll be some competition for GP3. But GP3 is strong, and it's the one that you can really just um, easily use directly if you, if you go to the website. Um, you know, I think, and also like, you know, like people claim that these chatbots are sentient, but I actually think it's like, I, at first I was kind of making fun of this myself, and then I was like looking at the, um, the results, they're pretty good. And then, and then we were talking with the folks at Google that like made these um, chatbots, and they were not so dismissive of, of this person as I thought. So, um, you know, I, I actually myself have not gotten a chance to play with the, the internal chatbot, but I, uh, it seems to be a very, very compelling um, chatbot, and of course, you know, we're about to train on an order of magnitude more data. and It'd be really interesting to see how, how compelling that is. Um, and so I don't know, I'm always like excited about like sort of the, the open source stuff. And there's been a lot of open source projects around this. Kind of hard to do, right? Because it requires so much training, but there's been a lot of different, you know, models and, and it's kind of open source, um, you know, projects that I think are kind of exciting to get involved in. None of these seem to be quite at the level of, of GPT-3, but, um, you know, a whole bunch of, kind of different places you can go to find this. And then, um, uh, yeah, it's been, it's, been, um, it's been cool to watch. Um, and I would say another thing that, I mean, I guess one thing I'm like passionate about with, with weights and biases is to make this as public as possible. So a lot of these people doing these open source projects have actually made kind of public reports about how, exactly how they're, they're training these large scale models. So that hopefully makes an easier entry point if you want to kind of get involved in that. Um, I don't know if you've tried code generation. I think it's amazing. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's, I actually use it, and a bunch of engineers use it. Um, but it's, um, it's not just good. It's like actually like also getting better very, very quickly. Um, you know, op I think OpenAI is maybe a little, little bit better, but not quite as like publicly available as the, um, you know, the GitHub one. But it's like exactly the same technique um, and pretty incredible Copilot. And then Replit built their own, which I thought was like super cool that this organization could just build their own, um, you know, code generation system. It's uh, it's really. I think this is like so exciting to see what happens next. I've been shocked at how effective these systems are. Um, and then I don't know, image generation diffusion models have been. Um, I mean, like the the thing of like the last like you know month, um, they've been like incredible, right? And so you know, kind of slightly different, um, slightly different architecture. I think like Lillian Wang always writes the best stuff, but she did a great post. Um, on diffusion models, kind of an entry point if you want to, you know, understand, you know, more about the details of of how these work. Um, you know, when 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 Dolly came out, I think it was impressive, but Dolly two has really been the one that I think, um, you know, open models. Again, I'm amazed how many machine learning people actually haven't tried um, these models. Um, I, when Dolly two came out, I actually built a thing with my daughter to do like her bedtime routine and, and just like illustrate it because um, my daughter's so small that like it's hard to make a contract with her, you know, to like make a routine because you can't read it, you know. But then we could illustrate it, so that convinced her that we actually had agreed that she's going to do these things before she goes to bed. But now she's a little older and she's trying to use Dolly two to rewrite this plan that involves <laughs> going to the park. <laughs> um, and then I was like the outpainting again. Like I just I put these in my slides because I think a lot of people haven't actually tried these things, and they are like spectacular. Like you take this and just like it just added this, right? Like just you know extended it, and you can literally you know, and this is like two months old, right? Like I you know I think the stability ones in some ways are um, you know stronger. Um, you know there's there's actually one thing I realized that I think you know maybe you might not know is if you try these the first time, you don't get very cool images at least in the open the open AI version. Um, but then there's these books that have come out about how to like do prompt engineering, which will really help you make more, um, you know, compelling um, images. So then there's like many variants of so this image in from from Google and others. Uh, there's there's Crayon, which I just want to call out. I think this isn't the strongest model. This is Dolly Mini, um, and I think this isn't necessarily like um, the the best model out there. But you can use it for free um, as much as you want. And then um, the this guy Boris actually I, he really built it in. 
um, public. So he basically read um, OpenAI's Dolly paper and then implemented it himself and got a really good working um, system. And he really put everything in his um, Dolly journal on, on weights and biases. So if you want to see the like narrative arc of somebody trying to get like you know a system working, um, wandb.me slash dolly dash journal um, is super cool. It's really fun to to watch him. And then finally, um, you know, stable diffusion is uh, or um, stable diffusion has really been um, incredible. They, they obviously like had a big launch um, last night where they talked about how you know they do um, video now and a lot of other things. But the um, the text image model is really what they're known for, and it's 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 really um, pretty amazing. And just to brag, they also used um, weights and biases, and you can look at some of their early. Um, work. We had a, a, I think dance diffusion is really cool, like maybe less well known. Um, but this is, uh, this is actually a model that they built that does um, also, no, like I, I guess Harmon AI is sort of the umbrella, but they built a model that um, kind of generates audio samples and it's like actually really like apparently useful. I'm not like a huge like EDM fan myself, um, but some people in the company are and, and um, it's, it's like, it's really cool to see like, you know, open music generation that's actually like compelling versus like super boring, you know, like, like I think there's been so a lot of amazing music generation where it's like technically amazing, but you wouldn't want to listen to it. But these guys are like really committed to making like, you know, kind of audio generation that you actually want to um, listen to. Um, and I was at the Stable Diffusion launch last night and they had a lot of um, music that I think was generated with this, with this system. And actually Justin here did an awesome, or we did an awesome interview with, the, um, with those guys. And it's, if you really want to nerd out on, um, uh, if you really want to nerd out on music and, and machine learning, um, I really recommend going to wb.me slash uh, Harmon AI. Um, you know, finally, I think the, the folding stuff is just super cool also. Not quite the same um, stuff, but kind of influenced by these, these large models. But, um, you know, OpenFold is really exciting to see, right, where they are kind of building an open source version of, of AlphaFold to help with, um, with, with research. Um, and um, I don't know if you guys have seen online. I mean, I guess I'm just showing you what I think is cool. But like online task completion, I like the, the Adept AI demo. Um, and they still haven't let me in their beta to verify this. But I think this is like the coolest demo I've ever seen, maybe, where you are basically typing tasks into a box. And then um, through Transformers, they're, they're like turning it into um, online research tasks, um, which, I, I, yeah, uh, this sort of seems like a real mind-blowing oh, um, thing. They were really doing code they may have been originally been doing Koja. Now I think they're doing um, uh, research. And um, yeah, several people have been like, I'll get you into their, their beta. And they, they haven't let me in their beta. So I'm a little suspicious <laughs> of, of any. I've, I've just been doing this long enough that like, you know, an ML product where they don't let you into their like beta, you don't know how. It might not work as well as the demo. But I, I still think it's like, I think it's intriguing. Actually, another thing that, that we saw is um, the runway, which makes like, a, like an ML video tool now has like, you can like actually put in like text of what you want. So it's like, uh, make the image like black and white and have it like fade in and stuff. And like for me, not really knowing how to use a video editing tool, it really looked amazing that you could just sort of like type in, you know, just in words, like the effects that you want. And it, it sort of seemed like, wow, maybe that's like a new kind of interface that people would really, um, you know, want to use. Um, and then I think Whisper came out, which I feel like was underappreciated how amazing this was. I actually kind of worked on, um, on NLP and speech to text generation. And I feel like OpenAI just sort of like obliterated an entire field of research. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, kind of like as an afterthought where it's just like, you know, this is trained with like most of the optimization happening on the data set collection, not on like, you know, not anything special about the model. Um, and then they have like what to my eye is a better than human level um, transcription system. And I, I just thought it was like incredible that they like, you know, open source. Like, you know, if this was around a few years ago, this would be like, thought of as like multi-billion dollar like IP. Um, and, and they just thought, well, you know, this is like we're doing other things, I guess, you know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, that's my like quick tour of um, large segments. I hope it's fun and I hope that, um, you know, don't be shy. If you come to our event, you should definitely reach out and, you know, ask for a demo and ask for um, a t-shirt. And if you do use our product, I would love to hear feedback. Um, I'm Lucas with a K, L-U-K-S, at WB.com and please shoot me an email. Thanks.